Welcome back to the Arena Grand Prix Race Day sponsored by Arena. I'm Tiffany Elias. Now, it was another successful stop in Austin at the University of Texas. The three-day meet is over, and Swimming World's Jeff Cummings is joining us for the final time this weekend to analyze tonight's events. Now, Jeff, you've been to many Grand Prix before this one. How did this compare? Well, I'll, I'll start by comparing it to the previous Austin meets, and I think the 2009 meet, just for reasons that we had the high-tech suits, it was a really fast meet, but since the, the tech suits were banned, I'd say this was one of the fastest ones we've had, um, surprisingly. I was a little bit surprised, but I think a lot of people were having some really um, great holiday training, and they just wanted to see where they were, and they you know rested a little bit, and we saw some great swimming by some people I didn't expect to see some fast times from this weekend, and I think that made it a little more exciting, although a lot of people were saying it was not that fast, but I really thought the opposite of that. Well, I think your point about holiday training is huge. That's going to factor into these swimmers drastically. I, I personally thought there were some fast events, but overall it wasn't the, the most exciting Grand Prix we've seen. But one of those fast swimmers that I want to talk about before we get started is 14-year-old professional swimmer Michael Andrew. Now, yesterday we know he broke the 50 freestyle national age group record, and this morning was the 100 backstroke by one one-hundredth of a second. Tonight was the 100 breaststroke. Now, Jeff, when Michael Andrew broke news that his decision to go pro, it was pretty controversial uh, because of his young age. And he continues to prove his talent and, and speed by breaking these records. Do you think going professional was the right move for Michael Andrew? Well, I think the, I, I think the decision was a good one. One him and his father, who's his coach. I think he just want the, the Andrews just wanted to make sure that they um, stay together as a, a tight knit group. And I think they had planned all along for Michael not to go to college, and they wanted to continue this ultra short race pace training all the way through his swimming career, which a lot of colleges aren't going to do. Probably no college is going to do. So I think they knew that college was going to be out of the question. So why not turn professional now? Uh, I think the true test is going to be when he becomes an adult and he truly grows into his body um, muscular-wise, muscle-wise. And he even told me that when I did an interview with him tonight. He's waiting to kind of fully grow into himself and he thinks he's going to really explode. And I think a lot of people are waiting to see what happens when he's 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah, I think everybody's waiting to see what happens. I mean, there's there, there's been statements of people comparing him to Michael Phelps. So those are big shoes to fill. We'll see, we'll see how that plays out over the next few years. Well, the first event of the night was the 200 Butterfly. 30-year-old Canadian Audrey LaCroix won the event, pretty solid 209. And on the men's side, Tom Lushinger, 157. Uh, Jeff, Tom has some pretty big shoes as well to fill. Phil, Michael Phelps again in that 200 Fly. Is he where he needs to be going into the end of the season? I think so, and, and I think maybe he's you know feels a little bit of pressure. He is now working at North Baltimore under Bob Bowman, who, as we know, guided Michael Phelps through all those you know what is it, 12 years of um, international success. So um, Tom knows he made a great choice. He's putting all his trust in Bob. And Tom looks great. I mean. This time last year, we wouldn't have thought that Tom was going to be one of the fastest 200 butterflies where we have in the country. So he's taken that mantle on pretty well. He looked real solid today. He had a nice um, battle with Tom Shields, who's also looking great in the 200 fly. And um, I think this is a good step forward for both Toms, actually, because uh, and until Michael comes out of that nine-month drug testing uh, blackout period, um, you know, we're looking for some solid 200 butterflies. And, of course, we also have Tyler Clary in the mix, who, as we know, couldn't swim the 200 fly today because of a back injury. So um, I think it was a great, great way for us to really kind of scope out who's going to be the top 200 flyers in the United States. I agree, and I think Tyler Clary would have been in that race had he have been able to be. And Tom Shields, he was a little further back than uh, in your morning swim show interview. You guys talked about how he's putting more emphasis on that 200 fly. I don't think he's quite there, but by the end of the season, I'm really anxious to see where his two fly is. Well, the, the thing about his 200 butterfly, or his butterfly in general, is it's all underwater. You know, the 200 fly at the NCAAs last March, he tied Michael Phelps' American record. Uh, and then at the duel in the pool, you know, he broke the American record in the 200 fly. Those are eight, eight 
underwaters he can do as opposed to just four here. So you cut it in half. He is, a, I wouldn't say severely limited now, but um, yeah, he knows he's got to do a lot more swimming. Well, Misty Hyman was able to do it, so we'll see if Tom can follow her, her trademark of those underwaters and translate it to the uh, long distance. Yep. But the next event of the night was the 100 breaststroke, and it was a close field. Trojan Jessica Hardy got her hand on the wall first, 107-0. Now, Jeff, have you had a chance to talk with Jessica Hardy after Yulia Efimova's positive drug test? Um, she tends to want to shy away from that, and I think she wanted to really put the focus on where on you know training right now and her, and what she was doing at this meet so uh, and, and it really was one of those things where a lot of people weren't talking about it um, I brought it up with a couple of people and um, just in passing and um, they didn't even know about it and it's not to say that you know they keep up with you know sports uh, swimming news in general but um, I think they just it just wasn't on a lot of people's radar um, and I think you know if it were someone who was in the United States I think that would be a big issue um, but yeah, it seems to have kind of um, broken out in the in the news kind of quietly, well, surprisingly for me. And it always is a sensitive subject, so we'll see how that translates over the next couple of weeks as more people continue to find out. But either way, we'll interested to see where that goes. Right. And Scotland's Ross Murdoch won the 200 breaststroke yesterday, claimed the 100 again tonight, 1.0058. And Mike Alexandrov, 101.3 for second. Now, Jeff, who is the U.S. going to send to Pan Pax at the end of the summer in this event? This seems pretty open as well. Apart it's, a very, it's a very open event. Um, I guess right at the top is you got, you got to put Kevin Cordes, um, who obviously isn't here because he's getting ready for the NCAAs, and most of the college, as most of the college swimmers are. Um, Nick Fink went to world championships. Uh, can't count him, I out. Mike Alexandrov is always right there, and he's never really broken through uh, to the top level since the 2010 Pan Pack. So um, it's going to be close, but I think right now I, I got to say Kevin Cordes is the one to really is the one who's going to be right at that top level for at least the next three years. Mike Alexandrov needs to pull a Eugene Gatsu where he just can bust out and finally get that gold medal. Because you're right, he's just been. He's been in the shadows for a while now, and he's really got to make a move while while he has time. Absolutely. All right, the last 100 stroke of the night was backstroke. Now, the Cal Bears backstrokers weren't there, so the door was wide open. Uh, the race fared very similar to the 200 backstroke. Hillary Caldwell, 101.5, followed by Megan Romano. And on the men's side, Matt Griever stepped up for a great swim, 53.7. Arkady by Channon and Ryan Murphy, only tenths of a second behind him. And Nick Thoman, who recently crushed multiple backstroke American records, he came in fourth. Now, Jeff, I thought this was an impressive race and probably the race, oh, most exciting race of the night. Yeah, I think a lot of people were looking forward to this because there was no clear-cut favorite. You have Matt Grievers, who's the Olympic and world champion, and Nick Thoman, who just had a great nationals. Um, Jacob Pebbly and Ryan Murphy, who are doing some great stuff this, this season. And then Arcadia Vietnam, who is always, like I told you, what, after the 200 backstroke, you never know what he's going to do. He's kind of, he can be up or down. You just never know until the race goes. And um, I think it was just one of those great events that nobody could tell who was going to win until the final touch. And I guess if it's going to be close, you got the 6'8 Matt Reavers that you can, you can bet on in that last second. I want to say something real quick about the women's 100 back, though, Tiffany. It's just, I, I'm really pleased to see Megan Romano putting some attention on backstroke. And, and maybe, you know, it's not going to be an event that she makes the Olympic team or, or an international team in just with the depth of backstroke in the United States. But I'm glad she's not, she's um, kind of diversifying herself right now, and it kind of it's paying off. I mean, she got some some good finishes here in, in the backstrokes. I agree, and I think post college sometimes you need that shakeup. You've been doing the same thing for so many years that maybe now backstroke will will move up. You never know. Well, next sure. up in the 200 IM. Kaylin Leverens came out on top again, 213-4. Now, it was fun to see Katie Ledecky in the mix swimming an off event. She came in fourth. Now, Jeff, I'm sure it's a weird feeling for Katie to come in fourth, but it must be so nice to have a low-stress event. Yeah, but she still came back like a rocket on that uh, freestyle. She was the only swimmer under 30, which, you know, a lot of the guys here swimming today weren't under 30. Uh, so, you know... 
if you're if you're ahead of Katie Ledecky going into freestyle, you better you know put everything into that 50. And Laura Sogar and I think it was uh, Katie Miley who are breaststrokers were leading um, after the breaststroke, and they barely barely beat Katie out. Yeah, it was it was fun to watch that. And she she decided to swim this race probably as a warm up before her 800, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But it's nice to see her changing it up a little bit. Yeah. And on the men's side, Connor Dwyer, 2 0 Now, Jeff, how is Connor swimming right now, in your opinion? How is he setting himself up for the end of the season? I th- it's weird because I think ever since he got to North Baltimore, I, I, I got the sense, and even I asked him about this, and he, he mentioned it a few times, is that he wants to have a multiple event schedule internationally. Now, whether that goes all the way to the Olympics or not, I'm not really sure because he can't do the 400 IA am and 400 free on the same day at the olympics that's a tough double to do that's not like ryan lockie doing the 200 am turn it back to do two 400s actually four if you count prelims and finals this, that's a little too tough to do so um but i think he wants to do something like you know make a 400 free relay do the 200 free do the 400 free 200 im so i think he's you know he's obviously in the best place to do that um and i think he's really had a great meet to kind of show that he is going to be someone who is not just someone to rely on the 800 free relay, which is what we've been kind of seeing him do for the past few years. And um, I, I'm really excited to see what he does in the 200 IM because it's, a, it, you know, outside of Ryan, if he comes back to full form this summer, um, it's really a wide open event. And, you know, he was almost on the world championship team last summer in the, in the 200 IM. So I think he's building confidence. Well, this meet for him was, I think, a statement of versatility. Now he's got to get the times down and, and be one of those top positions. All right, last individual event of the meet was the longest of the events, Jeff. Katie swam, as we just mentioned, the 200 IM shortly before this race, and it was a pretty mild 800, uh, in my opinion, for both Ledecky and uh, Lottie Fries, given that they were breaking world records last summer. So was this, what was your opinion of this race tonight? Was it just not that important for these girls to just put the gas to the floor? Well, I think... I think it's just been a long weekend for both of them. I mean, Lottie obviously didn't have the 200 IM before, but um, you know, having been on the deck at World Championships, this looked like an exact mirror of the 800 free final in Barcelona. Lottie Freach took it out. Katie Ledecky held back, and then the last 300, she just charged ahead and just easily took the win. So I was kind of, you know, it was kind of like deja vu all over again for me. But um, yeah, the time isn't great. I'm sure Katie wanted to go faster. I'm sure Lottie wanted to go faster. Um, I was standing next to Bob Bowman during the 800, and he wasn't really happy with the way Lottie Fries, who's who swims at North Baltimore, was splitting the race. So they got a lot of work to do. I'm sure Lottie knows she has a lot of work to do. Um, but I think it was it was a good training meet, tra- training race for them. You can't really expect them to be anywhere near world records. Um, distance swimming, it's hard for people to push record pace in the middle of the season. And like you said, it, it, it was more of a training race. That's what it looked like. And similar on the men's side, but Yannick Agnell, he won this event nearly 10 seconds ahead of Michael McBroom. I thought it was a pretty decent time for Agnell. And, uh, Jeff, what did you think about it on the guy's side? Well, before the race, I thought it would be Yannick Agnell taking the lead through about 800, and then people like Usman Luli and Michael McBroom running him down and taking it over. But Yannick Agnell was very, very consistent. You know, 30.3, 30.4 throughout the whole thing. Um, it's not to say he doesn't have that capacity because all we've known him for is the 200 and 400. But to know that he could put together a 15.07 in the middle of the season, I don't know. I think he and Bob Bowman and, and maybe even the French Swimming Federation need to think about putting him in the mile in the Olympics. He doesn't have, I mean, what does he have to do? Um, He may have the medley relay that last day at the Olympics. The mile and the medley relay are the same day. But um, I think that's something maybe he should pursue, maybe even 2015 at the World Championships. Well, he was solid this weekend from the 100 to the 1500. So whatever he decides to do, he's showing that he has that, that depth. But, Jeff, thanks for your analysis again tonight. Safe travels back to Phoenix. Thanks, Stephanie. It's good to see you. I'll see you back in the studio soon. All right, well, if you've missed any coverage from this weekend, make sure to go to our event landing page on SwimmingWorld.com. Complete coverage, interviews, and analysis. 
Thanks for watching Race Day, sponsored by Arena. I'm Tiffany Elias. We'll see you next time.